There's breaking news out of Ukraine overnight where a dramatic escalation in fighting has seen at least 51 people killed in Russia's deadliest attack on the country this year. Russian missiles hit a military facility and nearby hospital in the Ukrainian city of Poltava just hours ago, injuring more than 200 others. The Russian strikes come in response to Ukraine's incursion into the Kursk region in Russia, where the ABC has gained extraordinary access. Europe correspondent Catherine Diss and camera operator Fletcher Young were escorted by Ukrainian troops. And I spoke to Catherine a little earlier from Dnipro, just south of the latest flashpoint in Poltava. Catherine, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we've heard about this attack in the region of Poltava, the Russian attack. Dozens of people killed there. What else do we know? Good morning, Emma. Well, look, this is a devastating attack. This is the worst this year in death toll number. The, as you said, dozens of people have already been confirmed dead and that death toll just continues to keep rising. This was a brazen daylight attack by Russia. Two ballistic missiles were fired into a military institution and a hospital in the town of Poltava. That's around three hours drive from where we are now. While rescue crews have managed to put out the flames there. They will be working well into the night to try and pull anyone else that might still be stuck in the rubble. We've heard from President Zelensky today. He has condemned the attack. He has described Moscow as Russian scum and promised retaliation. And just having been here for the past week, Emma, I can say that the number of attacks on uh, heavily populated cities in Ukraine and civilian infrastructure has certainly increased since Ukraine's incursion across the border into Russia in August. And while the Kremlin isn't saying so, this certainly feels like retaliation. And what's the situation like where you are? I mean, we've talked about the pressure ramping up. Um, we've seen more attacks on both sides. What's it like for you there? Yeah, look, we're in Dnipro, which is in the southeast of Ukraine. Last night, we were woken up to a very loud bang. There was a ballistic missile that landed around 15 minutes drive from where we are. That, of course, worrying our managers back in Sydney. Um, but that was in an industrial area of Dnipro. The strikes are really around the Kramatorsk, um, Pokrovsk area at the moment. That is a strategic town that Russia is trying to capture. It is around two and a half hours drive from here. But the fighting there is incredibly intense. Um, Tens of thousands of people have already evacuated from Pokrovsk. We were there yesterday and hundreds more trying to get the train out of town to larger centres like this one or Kiev to try and flee that fighting. Military experts telling us here that it could be days before Russian forces take that town, giving it more access to the strategically important Donbass region and, a port, of course, an area that Vladimir Putin has tried to capture since he annexed Crimea in 2014. Catherine, you've been part of a crew that's gone into Russia the first time the ABC's been into Russia in five years. What was that like? Can you tell us about it? Yeah, Emma, I think the best way to describe it was surreal because no one really anticipated that uh, Russia would become the invaded in this war. But there we were standing on Russian soil occupied by Ukrainian forces. Uh, we travelled in an armoured vehicle across the border with Ukrainian troops uh, whilst we approached the town of Sudja, which is the first Russian village that Ukrainian forces captured. There was little sign of any fighting at all. It felt really calm and sort of bizarrely uneasy. But once we got on the ground, um, it was very clear that we were still in an active war zone. We could hear artillery um, booming and cracking in the distance, both incoming and outgoing, but also the threat of drones, which has really become um, the risk there on the ground because Russia is able to send them in to gather reconnaissance, but for also target attacks against uh, either soldiers, their equipment, um, any infrastructure they set up, but also um, uh, because, uh, of course, Russia is not targeting that centre with any sort of ballistic weapons because its Russian citizens are still living there. Um, and it became very clear that threat of, of drones just minutes after we were on the ground. Um, we were ordered to take cover underneath trees because the soldiers spotted a enemy drone in the sky. Uh, they later told us that that was tracking our vehicle. Moscow is incredibly sensitive about journalists going into its 
States Territory. It's already issued arrest warrants for several Western journalists who have crossed into Russia since the Ukrainian occupation, accusing them of illegally crossing the border. Um, we also, whilst on the ground there, Emma spoke to some of the Russian citizens who have been left behind. It's an incredibly tragic set of circumstances, mostly the elderly and the sick. They're um, sheltering inside an old school. Um, we spoke to many of them. Um, them telling us that they're angry with Vladimir Putin for abandoning them, forgetting them and not giving them any way to get out. Um, interestingly, they also told us that they were very grateful for the Ukrainian soldiers because they had been bringing them food, water and also medicines and providing them with a doctor. Um, so um, interestingly, seeing the Russians there capture, in obviously captured territory, but forming an unlikely bond with their captors. Um, but it's important to note that there was no control over who we could speak to by the Ukrainian military. They didn't listen to our interviews and they didn't view any of the content that we're about to publish. Catherine, what were the Ukrainian soldiers telling you? Um, what's morale like? What the, is their expectation? What is their fear of what could be to come? Yeah, look, the soldiers that took us around um, weren't allowed to give us any indication as to what they thought of the incursion or whether they thought it was a good idea or a bad one. But certainly, despite the threats that I've mentioned there on the ground, uh, morale is high among the soldiers there. They're very much in control of the situation. But it's very different down here where we are closer to Pokrovsk and there's certainly questions that are being asked about the incursion. Was it the correct thing to do in terms of rerouting some of the troops up to, to launch that incursion when they were really needed down here in the southeast where we're hearing reports that they're being outnumbered four to one. So big questions remain but they will they are continuing at this point in time to push further into Russia as Russian forces move further towards Pro here. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, your report is absolutely compelling. Um, so thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Certainly compelling and brave mm. reporting by Catherine and camera colleague Fletcher. Yeah, absolutely. They've done a great job and you can read more online as well on the ABC News website. OK, let's come back home now. Crucial and highly anticipated economic data released today. It'll show the GDP figures for the June quarter and actually what it means for Australians struggling with the cost of living. Independent economist Nikki Hutley joins us now from Sydney. Nikki, very good morning to you. What are you expecting those figures will show? Good morning to you, Michael. Well, it's always really hard to predict these numbers, they, and they usually get revised anyway. But something pretty small, um, a small amount of growth in the quarter, around 0.3% or so, what that means is the economy overall over the last year will have only grown by around 1%. That's in real terms, so putting prices to the side. But that's really very weak growth. OK, and uh, what's the outlook? Do, do you expect that weakness is continuing as we speak? Yeah, and look, that's the most important thing. These numbers are backwards looking. Yeah. It's for the June quarter, of course, but they set the scene for where we're coming from, and that is a very weak economy. The big argument is where we're going to now, and there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Um, you might recall that the Reserve Bank, after the August meeting um, of the board last month, said, you know, the economy is still too strong, demand's too strong, and particularly what the government spending is too strong. Even at the same time, while we're seeing things like real retail trade go backwards, per capita spending going backwards, so we know households are doing it very tough. It is a really difficult question. There are risks on both sides. There are people could go out and spend more of their tax cuts. They haven't so far in July. They could, um, you know, start seeing um, better increases in their household income because prices are coming back slowly. Um, at the same time, the world is very uncertain. There's a lot of downward momentum in our economy, in building and consumer demand. So there's a lot of balanced risks here about mm -hmm. where the economy goes. My sense is we're probably close to the bottom of this cycle, but things still don't look that rosy for quite a while to come. Is there a danger, therefore, based on that assessment of Australia tipping into a recession either towards the end of this year or early next year? 
Yeah. I think it's too early to use the R word. I think there's a few things coming through that will help the economy lift a little bit. But, you know, that doesn't help house households when you're the GDP per capita, which is, you know, how big our slice of the overall economic pie is, is still coming backwards. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's been shrinking for a couple of years now almost. So people are doing it tough. Obviously, prices are still rising, um, not as much as they were a year ago, thank goodness. But they're still they're still going up. Um, household incomes aren't growing that much. We know unemployment's rising. Um, so it's still a very difficult environment, but it looks at the moment as though, like in many other countries, the RBA may just have pulled up an economic miracle um, and get us to have that soft landing rather than the recession. Oh, OK, because that was going to be the next question. I mean, no, no matter which way you slice and dice them, the, the, the figures will be pretty weak uh, when they're released today. Uh, could they prompt the Reserve Bank, therefore, to start cutting rates earlier than what the market anticipates? Yeah, look, I think despite the fact that the Reserve Bank Governor was um, basically saying no rate cut before Christmas, I think there's still a lot of us in the market, and I'm one of them, that think it's way too early to have ruled out a, a November rate cut. Um, I think there is a huge amount of weakness. And the thing is, the economy is like a, a giant ship. It's like the Titanic, but hopefully we don't hit the iceberg. Um, but the steering takes a while. And so if you wait until the economy is really, really slow and prices have come all the way back to target, then you've waited too long to cut interest rates. So it's a a tricky time for the RBA. It's obviously a nerve-wracking time for mortgage holders in, in particular. I don't think it's... I, I think you cannot rule out a November rate cut. Um, the RBA has said it'll look at the data, so we need to see another fall in inflation, even if it's at the margins, and it'll be interesting to see what the employment data does, because that's definitely weakening quite a bit. Interesting. Possibly a Melbourne Cup Day surprise, which is when the RBA meets in November. Nikki, as always, we appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's take a look at what else is making news. A man and woman rescued from their stricken yacht off the New South Wales coast have expressed gratitude and huge relief at being back on dry land. 60-year-old Brett and 48-year-old Lisa arrived back into Sydney last night on the police boat Nemesis. They were rescued about 170 nautical miles east of Nowra after a multi-agency rescue mission, which was launched after they activated a distress beacon on Monday afternoon. We had a good sleep on the way back. I uh, didn't sleep much last night. So. Oh, I'm feeling good now. Good coffee. One of the guys made a great coffee and <laughs> And a meat good. pie. Yeah, and a meat pie. That helped. Yeah. What are you South Australia's Doctors' Union is urging the government to act across all facets of the state's health system and not to get caught up in semantics around ramping. The head of the Premier's delivery unit, Rick Morris, told a parliamentary committee yesterday that Labor never committed to fixing ramping, instead to fix the ramping crisis and that he expected progress to be made by the next election. The Federal Environment Minister says new technology is being trialled in a $60 million plan to combat the threat of feral cats. The money will be directed to 55 locations across the country. The government is considering feedback on a draft strategy to manage feral cats nationally, with data showing cats kill more than 1.5 billion native animals each year. Iran has summoned Australia's ambassador to Tehran over a post on the embassy's Instagram account supporting LGBTQI plus by marking Wear It Purple Day. The foreign ministry reportedly summoned Ambassador Ian McConville and condemned the post as insulting to Iranian and Islamic culture and contrary to international norms. Mr McConville told local media the post was not intended as an insult and there was no mention of Iran in it. A World Health Organisation report has found no link between mobile phone use and increased risk of brain cancer. The review of dozens of studies over a 28-year period across 10 countries found no rise in incidences of brain cancer, despite a huge increase in wireless technology over the same period. The West Australian Government is offering a grant of up to $150,000 to help film producers to make truth-telling virtual reality documentaries about First Nations stories. The aim is to show the films in museums and festivals around the world. Truth-telling is one of the pillars of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that included, of course, the proposed voice to Parliament. Truth-telling is really something where film can play a major part in telling those stories and VR as an immersive film technology is a great way that people can get really immersed in the story and be a part of that story and understand that story fully. 
Okay, let's take a quick look at global markets now and everything is pointing down. The Dow Jones has tumbled. The Australian dollar's lost a bit too. It's now buying 67.1 US cents. Brent crude, gold, they're all down as is the futures. And New Zealand is nearly tripling fees for foreign tourists from October, saying it wants to ensure high quality experiences for visitors. The levy, which will now be around 92 Australian dollars, doesn't apply to visitors from Australia or the Pacific, which make up the bulk of tourists. But the country's tourism industry is worried that it, along with increased visa costs, could damage a sector which is still recovering from strict pandemic border closures.